Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster, PhD, for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. The title of this lecture, an odd one, I admit, is a lecture on Third World Ukraine. Third World Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is the poorest country in Europe. And it is generally classified by international bodies as lying within the third world. Now, when we think of the third world, we don't ordinarily think of Europe. But Ukraine belongs in the third world. By any measure, it is poor. And it has a lot of problems. Uh, when Ukraine was still functioning effectively... Uh, Ukraine had one of the highest rates of sex trafficking in the world. It was right up there with Thailand. Thailand and Ukraine, two of the major sex trafficking capitals of the world. Very sad. A lot of um, Ukrainian children especially, and women, uh, kidnapped, stolen, and sold for a profit. And Ukraine was so weak, had such a poor quality government, that it was really unable to stop that sex trafficking. So, uh, it is poor, and it is third world. But, Ukraine was also a part of the former Soviet Union. Ukraine is a large country. The largest country with its borders contains entirely within Europe. And as such, it was a large republic in the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And thus, Russia, which is in a sense the descendant of the Soviet Union and regards itself as such, and is seen that way by the United Nations as well, has long considered Ukraine to be one of its central allies in that region. NATO entered into a handshake agreement, and regrettably it was only a handshake agreement with Russia that it would not take former Warsaw Pact countries and bring them into NATO. NATO was lying, or if it wasn't lying, it very quickly changed its mind. Soon, many of the countries lying on the border of Russia became a part of NATO. Even more became a part of the European Union, the EU. And so, understandably, Russia felt cornered. Imagine, imagine if China or Russia came and uh, conquered uh, Cuba or conquered Canada, took those places over. How would Americans feel? What would the U.S. government do in that case? Would it simply lay back and play dead? I doubt it. I mean, I don't know, but I find that hard to conceive uh, the U.S. simply laying back and playing dead under that kind of circumstance. So, understandably, Russia was upset when NATO, and particularly the U.S., overthrew the government, the Russian-supported government in Ukraine, and installed its own government, which ended up being led by Vladimir Zelensky. Zelensky was not their first choice, but he has worked out for them. And so I think that for the most part, the, the United States and NATO more broadly uh, are pleased with Zelensky. Russia certainly is not. Zelensky has turned out to be an enemy of Russia. Now, Zelensky 
is an ethnic Russian. He's an ethnic Russian in Ukraine. There are a lot of ethnic Russians scattered throughout the former republics that made up the Soviet Union because Russians migrated there. It was all a part of the same country at one time. But Zelensky, it turns out, has become a Ukrainian champion, a Ukrainian leader, not a Russian leader, and a leader ultimately opposed to Russia. That was not always the case. Zelensky used to have reasonably good relations with Russia. If you recall, Zelensky, prior to becoming a politician, was a comedian. And in fact, his political party is named after the comedy show that starred Zelensky. And that show was very popular in Russia because it was in Russian, not in Ukrainian. And it was also popular in the parts of Ukraine which host ethnic Russians. But the tensions were flaring. And pretty soon after the U.S. put Zelensky in charge, or at least condoned the fact that Zelensky was in charge, Russia was manifestly unhappy. And it effectively declared war on Ukraine. Many of the things that Putin said were not exactly true, maybe borderline true, like that uh, Ukraine is run by Nazis. I think that Putin should look in his own backyard before he looks at Ukraine. There are plenty of Nazis in Russia as well. Plus, Putin's favorite philosopher is a Russian fascist who memorably has stated that his major regret in, in life was that fascism was started in Italy and not in Russia. Then that is Russia's favorite philosopher? I wonder if that was the case when Putin was running the KGB. I would not be surprised if it was. Maybe. I mean, people who worked for the Russian government were often opportunists. They were not necessarily true believers in the Communist Party. They got ahead because they knew how to play the game. And that is what they did. And it appears to me that that is what Putin did as well. But after Putin was freed from the constraints of the USSR, he allowed his fascism to come into full light. And that is manifested in his war against Ukraine. So, when you look at Ukraine as a third world country, and then you look at the way that the United States and NATO have effectively taken over Ukraine, or at least pulled Ukraine onto their own side, which was apparently not very difficult. Zelensky seemed fairly enthusiastic about it and still does. Um, he was, I mean, he was willing to go to a war about it. Realistically, Zelensky could have simply given up to Putin and allowed Russia to take over Ukraine. But Zelensky would not do that. And so I think based upon that, one can only conclude that Zelensky was a fan of NATO and a fan of the EU. And very early on, he indicated his desire to join both of them. When that seemed somewhat unlikely, he basically adjusted to it, but he always made it clear that that is what he wanted. He wanted to be seen as a part of the West and not as a part of the East. So that's pretty crooked. 
That's pretty crooked what NATO did, especially considering the handshake agreement that it made with Russia. And to turn around and basically stab Russia in the back. Now, that is nothing new for NATO or the U.S. I mean, we have been stabbing people in the back for decades. But Putin did not like it. And so what did Putin do? Putin went to war against Ukraine. And he started bombing cities, resulting in a massive exodus from Ukraine to neighboring countries like Hungary and Poland. Um, but still, Ukraine is a third world country. So, as a Maoist third worldist, what do I do with that? It puts me in a bit of a quagmire. On the one hand, I don't like the fact that Ukraine has basically become a part of the American empire, which it has. But I also don't like the fact that uh, Russia has been bombing a third world country as a Maoist third worldist. So I'm split. I'm split, as I am sure a lot of you are as well. I really have no clear decision that I can make regarding the situation. Why? Because the situation is far from clear. Um, it is a mix of contradictions. A third world country, which is now allied with NATO, the US, and the EU, and which has NATO and other European countries supplying Ukraine with armaments. So it's not a, a question that I know how to answer. I really don't. I hope that one of you, or maybe more than one of you, can fill my place in this, because I literally don't know where to go with this. Before I made this podcast, I tried to think of finding a way out. I felt obliged to make it just because it was relevant. And if something occurs to me and it seems relevant, it seems kind of cowardly for me to make an excuse and just back down and say, no, this topic is much too sensitive. I can't, I'm not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole. That's not who I am. And I could not do that under any circumstances. But again, contradiction. Now, in the capitalist world system, there are loads of contradictions. So this contradiction is nothing new, except it is a weird contradiction because you are talking about a third world country. And as a Maoist third worldist, I believe that revolutions will start in the third world or in indigenous lands, or perhaps in both. But will revolutions start in Ukraine, per se? Hmm, I doubt it. But I guess it's possible, considering the way in which Ukraine has been bombed, that it might inspire Ukrainians to start revolutions to overthrow the existing system to overthrow the capitalist world system and establish a communist one in its place. But I honestly find it hard to believe what I just said. I mean, I could conceive of it, but I can only conceive of it with two hands tied behind my back. So there you have it, a difficult situation, a quagmire. A quagmire using a Maoist third worldist perspective, or as I often call it, a socialist from below, third worldist, indigenous perspective. Either way, um, it is not a situation that I know what to make of. I wish I did.
Do I like easy answers? Mm, the answer to that is no. In general, I prefer ambiguity. Most academics, most scholars like ambiguity. Why? Because ambiguity is seen as an invitation to explore the subject more than one has in the past. Ambiguity is a sign of, gee, I don't know this and I need to learn it. So, no, ambiguity per se does not bother me, except that in thinking about this, I think that the situation is purely ambiguous and that there is literally no escape from that because whatever direction one turns, whether it is to the fact that NATO has basically stolen Ukraine or to the fact that NATO is a third world country, one is left with no easy answers. So if you have any, and I really hope that you do, I wish that you would share them with me um, in the comments section, which is right below the discussion section, which is right below this video. And perhaps together, we can discuss it and try to make sense out of it. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.